Well, Gabriel came to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now think about that. Even though you're in, in, in the nation, the city, the house, the street, the, the address, the specific person in the house by a specific name, you said, well, he probably did. You know, Mary. Uh, well, look at this. You could put your name there. This, this, God cares about this stuff. He runs a whole universe and does all this kind of stuff and still cares about you and your personal needs. In verse 28, he, Gabriel brings a great salutation. Coming in, Gabriel said to her, Mary... Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this could be. And so the angel helps her out. A great salutation, he helps her out. In verse 30, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now that's interesting to me as well. Is it possible that Gabriel really knew what was going on in her heart or was he getting body language? We're all familiar with body language, aren't we? That, that's, that's the kind of stuff that causes me to ponder myself. I, mean, I find that very interesting. Don't, don't be afraid, Mary. I think you and I on body language could have seen somebody and know that they were fearful, don't you think so? Maybe that was it. But I have no idea whether angels could do all that, but he sure diagnosed it, didn't he? Either, of, either through great observation, like you and I could if we cared about the person, or he could actually do that. But he understood she was afraid. Fear is not a hard thing to have body language and figure it out, though, is it? It's like anger. When it gets to that level, you can see it. So, I don't know. It's just stuff I ponder about. Now, in verse 31 through 33, he gives why he came. He gives a great Bible lesson. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Do you realize that Mary already is in that Bible study frame of mind? That Mary has already been thinking about this stuff doctrinally? So that he doesn't, listen, he doesn't have to explain any of this to Mary. All he has to do is tell her. See, he didn't explain any of that. She already knew it. All he had to do is bring it to her remembrance. You know the Messiah that we've been studying about for... And listen, she's been with Elizabeth on this same mission herself. John, with Mary's child, John the Baptist, as the forerunner to the Messiah, she's already been prepped doctrinally, scripturally, for this visit. Well, you know, I jumped into chapter 1. I don't like to do that, but I jumped into the middle of that chapter. And so he, he lays out that you're going to give birth to the Messiah, the Son of God. Now we come to verse 34. Her great, a great question. She says, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? Mary, caught up in the moment of all this information that's really heavy, it doesn't dawn on her about Isaiah 7.14. It will later, but we're going to give her a break here. She's had a lot to digest. But she asks a great question, and he gives a great answer. Another doctrinal lesson. Listen. 
all the great questions you have about God, all the great questions you have about what does the Bible mean about this, all the great questions you have, why is God doing this in my life? All of these great questions that you have, God has got the answer for you. And it will be revealed through His Word. Every bit of it. The angel answered and said to her, another Bible lesson, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived in her old age that also was an impossibility that became a possibility. Listen. <laughs> All the things that you face that you think are impossible are only impossible to you, but they're all possible with God. Do you get that? There's no way you're going to get through this life that you don't face the impossibilities in your life. What am I going to do now? I don't have this. All things are possible with God that are impossible with man. Well, we'll see it. Behold, even your, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, Mary's young age. Elizabeth is old, and yet God's going to do a miracle on both ends. And she who was called barren, that, that's her impossibility, is now in her sixth month of pregnancy. Watch this. For nothing. That big word. Uh, for nothing will be impossible with God. See, Elizabeth thought she was in an impossibility. Mary thinks, how is this going to be? I'm a virgin and how is this going to be? Listen, but God tells her how it's going to be possible, doesn't he? That's the importance of the Word of God. The Word of God has told her how, how the impossible can be possible. And what she's got to do now is faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. That's how it clicks in your soul. Go like, this is possible because of God. I'm going to take his word serious in my life because this is by, listen, when God does the impossibility, when God brings possible, the impossibility of your life, he shines out. You think he doesn't shine? Well, he does in your heart. <laughs> he does in your heart. Nothing will be impossible with God. Watch this great response in verse 38. A great response to nothing's impossible with God. Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel went, I'm done here. <laughs> Mission completed. Mission completed. My job was to bring you the message. Your job was to believe it. Now those two things have collided. I can be moving on. Isn't that wonderful? He left her with the Word of God, and the Word of God is enough to make the impossible possible. Do you get that this Christmas? Some of you are going to need it. Some of you are going to need it. If not, I did. <laughs> if not, you, I. Well, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 11. 
a new covenant promise to you and I. New covenant promise called the Eucharist. Let's have a word of prayer to close the Christmas story and open up our story. Close Mary's and open ours. Let's have a word of prayer. You know the drill. If there's any unconfessed sin in your life, confess it. Mental attitude, sin, sin, the tongue, overt sin. Confess it. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive and for and to cleanse us. That allows the Holy Spirit to be the dynamic teacher of your life, to bring the experience of the Eucharist into the reality of your life, and then the Bible study to follow. Our Father, we thank you that you're faithful in your character to the plan, to your plan and the Word, the Word of God the plan of God, the mission of God, the ministry of God. How do we not know that you are faithful? How is it possible that we don't believe that you can take the impossibilities and take the I am off the front of the word? I mean, you're the one that created the word and the language. If we understand anything about your character and the power of the word of God in our life, we know that all things are possible through his word, like Gabriel said to Mary, which was also true for Elizabeth. It's also true for us, Father, if we have faith. We will see things made possible that were impossible and give you a day to shine out the character of God in our life. We need some of that this Christmas, Lord. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The key word for me, for the Christian, is the word remembrance. What are you to remember about the bread you're going to put in your mouth? It's symbolic of the body of Christ that hung on a cross to bear your sin and mine. You've got to get that. You've got to get that. They say, well, I'm thinking about that. Well, Willie got it. Has everybody got a Eucharist cup? Make sure you got a Eucharist cup. If you're a believer, you need a Eucharist cup. I believe that's it, Rick. We, we, uh, we normally pick those up on our way in uh, as a reminder. So the body, the the the... You know, the, the bread on top of the cup represents the body of Christ. Represents the body of Christ. First Peter 2.24, that hung on a cross for our sins. They were placed on his body, not on mine. And there's much to be thankful about this. But what did that mean? Well, on that piece of paper you have that's in your bulletin, it talks about virgin birth, which was our story, Right? He's got to be virgin born. He's got to be born outside Adam's, the slave market of Adam's sin. Got to be born out that way. He, can't, he cannot do that if he's got Adam's sin upon his life. And if he'd, have born, if he'd have been born through Joseph, he would have Adam's sin. Can't do that. He'd have, there, therefore, he'd have to die for his own. And that wouldn't include us. But he died outside Adam's slave, market of sin, so that he could die for all sin, past, present, future, of all the human race. He died one death on one cross at one time in history to clear up the whole thing of Adam's death. You'll never face it against once you believe it. 
you should understand his impeccability. For 33 years or so, he lived without committing sin, not mentally, verbally, or any way. I mean, just think how impossible that idea would be. And, and <laughs> I couldn't stand it the first time I said it, let alone the second time. <laughs> so we call that impeccability. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin became sin for us on that cross. He's hypostatic man. He's 100% God and 100% man. I can't begin to tell you I understand that. I can't begin to tell you. I, 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 you know, I wasn't invited to a fish cook-off with him. You know, I, I didn't ever had that opportunity. But I just have to believe that. I have to believe that. I mean, there's so much evidence in Scripture about it. I mean, how would I understand virgin conception? But I understand the theology of it. Don't mean I, I have a good grip of that. I just believe that. I don't have to understand the science behind it. I'll know it when I get to heaven. And go, and I'm like, wow, was that easy? I never thought of that. How? Come on. Well, anyhow. So you want to, when you take this bread, and we are in a moment, <clears throat> when you take that bread... <laughs> Be sure to reflect on what that bread represents in remembrance for your life, right? So let's do this. Let's do this. Let me tell you something about the bread. Let me tell you something important about the bread. <clears throat> You're to eat it. Take your time. Chew it up really fine. So that your mind has a chance to really evaluate the importance of what you just did. That's why he says, eat the bread and drink the cup. The emphasis on eating here. Somebody in your family probably told you you had to chew that food so many times before you could swallow it, right? Nah, they probably don't teach that, man. If you were my age or close to it, you knew that because they taught you that. That's what I'm talking about here. Be sure you chew it fine before you die so that your mind has a chance to really evaluate. When he had given thanks, verse 24, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is due. In the same way, giving thanks, in, that's why we call it Eucharist, good thanks, good reason to praise. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The cup he held up in Luke 22 at the Last Supper was the, old, was the Old Covenant Passover cup. He said, that's been changed. And listen, the way it's going to be changed is because he's going to die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead the third day. He said, this cup, by the time we do this, the next time we do this, you will understand why this is the cup of the new covenant. Because the next time we do this, I will have died on a cross, I will have been buried, and I will have been raised from the dead. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, the word remembrance. What did the blood purchase for me? Listen, listen to me. When you take the Eucharist, it's not enough to say, my salvation. That's all right if you're a one-day-old believer. 
But you got more than just salvation in the blood of Christ. If you do a word study on the blood of Christ, you will find out that there are at least nine things that the blood of Christ purchased for you while on the cross. And they're listed in, that, in the bulletin. Redemption is based on the blood of Christ. Reconciliation is based on the blood of Christ. Justification is based on the blood of Christ. And the list goes on at least ninefold. The sacrificial, and listen, we have just done an intense study of the blood, of of what that represents in the New Covenant Gospel. I did 12 lessons. I went in great detail with you. If you're visiting with us on the internet, you just go to the website, Doctrinal Studies, and pull it down and study them. You should study them. Of what the blood of Christ represents. Yes, it's salvation. But in specific, it's your, righteous, it's your righteousness, your redemption, your justification, your propitiation, your sanctification, victory in the angelic conflict. All these things are yours, and I put them on that list. And so when you, when you, when you take the cup, and we are in a moment, when you take that cup, you're to drink it. Don't gulp it. Sip it in. And while you're doing that, understand, at least look it down, and between now and the next Eucharist, study the nine things that you've received by the blood of Christ. Get at least one verse. Get it in your soul. Well, let's take a look at this cup. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Right? So let's do this. Let me pray over the two elements. Father, we are so thankful as American Christians to live in a nation that is still free for assembly. We're still free in a pulpit to preach the word of God without censorship. The only censorship is what we place on ourselves by not assembling like we're told in, in Hebrews 10.25, don't forsake the assembling of yourself. We have not Father, we're here. We've been faithful to come to study your word. We've been faithful to come and take part in the Eucharist to be reminded of what Christ provided for us that we can take to the rest of the world. We can take it to Moody, Alabama, St. Clair County, Alabama, the southern region, the United States, and to the far ends of the earth. It is our calling, and we take that serious. Encourage our hearts. We have the message. We are the ambassadors of Christ. I pray we would be good ambassadors this year. As we close out one year and open a whole new year in Moody, Alabama, we pray, Father, that we would be evangelical. We have the good news, and we need to share it with everybody. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me finish. For as long as you eat the bread, you drink the cup... You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that sin in their life unconfessed, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. You'll be disciplined. If a man examines himself, we did that in preparation. I hopefully you did it personally. And in so doing, he is, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. These terms are very essential that you take your time. For he who eats and drinks, drinks and ju- drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. First John would, nine ta- would take care of that, and if you don't take care of it, you'll be disciplined. This reason, discipline, many among you are weak, sick, and a number sleep. 
That's a euphemism for dying to be with the Lord. If we judge ourselves rightly, 1 John 1 9 stated again, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined, there it is, by the Lord. Okay? I'm going to ask Gary Horton to close this out. Gary, give me a prayer and let's get into Bible study. Thank you for the resurrection because a dead man cannot give eternal life. Yes. Thank you for our church. Thank you for those who have been a blessing to my life. Thank you for those who are faithful. Thank you for Ron. Thank you to encourage him in every area of his life and feed us from the Word of God as we can walk out of here applying these truths to our lives so that we have an impact in the lives of others. Sanctify these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Gary. Notice on your paper, we last week we closed out the New Covenant Gospel. We opened up the New Covenant Church Doctrines, which we are now in a new series on. Today we're looking at Romans, if you'll turn there. We're looking at Romans, the sixth chapter. I really hate to do that with Romans. Chapter 5, 6, 7, 8 ought to be always attached together. But such as it is. I'm after a specific point of doctrine in these five verses. Notice your paper, Baptized into Christ. Notice your paper heading, Baptized into Christ. What I'm going to do in this hour, I'm going to introduce you to that doctrine. What does it mean to be baptized into Christ? Listen to what Paul says. Here, here is six one. What shall we say then? Is that a question? Yeah. Pay attention to how many questions there are asked in five verses. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? How many have I got? Got two questions. May it never be. Is that an answer? Yes. It's just an <laughs> A very strong answer, isn't it? Here's what we might say. Don't even go there. Don't even go there. What were the two questions? Don't even go there. What were the two questions? What shall we say then? You know, where that, you, know, you know where that question comes from? The fifth chapter, verse 20, 21. Let's look at that. The law came in so that the transgression, Adam's sin, would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounds all the more. Right? Listen, you know what that means? Every time you confess your sin, grace abounds. Right? When you got saved, you know what happened? Grace abound. Okay. So that, so that as sin reigned, watch verse 21 now. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign. Look at that word reign. It means to be a master. Reign, a king. A master. Sin reigning in death, even so grace should reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then the question, what shall we say then? Do you see? Without that, that don't make any sense. But you understand this is a book. And he's just come off from chapter 5 with answers to, to questions that people are asking that they, they don't have a reason to ask because you've already got the answers. <laughs> what shall we say then? What, what does that mean by itself? Well, it has no meaning by itself. So, 
it's used to bring a, an answer. The question's okay, but it's, it's, it's tacked on to 21. 21 was the answer. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign. See, people had doubts about their, their salvation, had doubts about eternal life. They had doubts. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may, may increase? See, that's what they were saying in verse 20. And what's his answer? May it never be. Here's the third question. How many am I, how am I searching? How many am I looking for? All right. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Over the next few weeks, I will give you the answer. And I will tell you mechanically how, how that's true. Verse 3. I'm in Romans 6. Verse 3. Or do you not know? Boy, that's an interesting idea because the word do you not know is agonizo, which you get the word agnostic or ignorance. Do you not know that all of us, watch out now, because this, we're coming to my, my text. Do you not know that all of us, you know what he didn't say? He did not say some of us. <laughs> he said all of us. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? He's not talking about water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit of God. You've got to be baptized into Christ. Seated at the right hand of God the Father. How do you get baptized into Christ? Well, you're going to see today it's done by the Holy Spirit. And listen, when today's over, you can't say, I don't know. You can't plead ignorance. When I get through with you today, there will be none of that. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Listen, here's what people don't play around. They don't understand this enough. When you are reading the Bible and Jesus' titles come up, you pay attention to them. Sometimes Paul will call him Jesus Christ and sometimes he will call him Christ Jesus and he's emphasizing something really important to you. In the Old Testament, he's always called Christ, Messiah. In the New Testament, Christ is given a human name term Jesus. Even the unbelievers referred to him as Jesus of Nazareth. They hung it on a sign over his head on the cross. Matthew 1.21 tells us he was called Jesus for he had come to save his people from their sin. John 1, 11 through 13 says, unfortunately, his people didn't accept him. But to everyone who does believe in him, he will give them eternal life. How about that? How about that, Gentile? Are you not happy for that deal? It should be. Therefore, because of verse 5th chapter, verse 21, 6th chapter, 1, 2, and 3, therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, you ask why for. And it always has something to do with what's previously been stated.
By the time we get to the end of verse 3, how many questions have been asked? Count them. By the time I get through verse 3, how many questions are on your paper? In your Bible, how many question marks? Well, I, look, I, I have two in verse 1. I have one and two, right? Verse 2. How many is that? <laughs> Thank you. And now I got one in verse 3. Now I got four. No, of course it isn't. Of course, it's not water. We, we use this with water baptism, but this is not what water baptism is about. This is how you get into Christ. And that's spiritual. Now, therefore, based on the answers of the four, the four questions, working off the questions, the four questions have been asked, which go back to 5th chapter, verse 21. You do know that. I, I just explained that to you. Therefore, therefore, we have been, and, and some people are all people. You suppose the thief on the cross got it? Yeah, he will get it, yeah. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism. He will get it as soon as Christ completes it. <laughs> right? Like the Old Testament people. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead, that's the place of the dead. Where was he raised from? Sheol. I spent 12, I don't know how many weeks, but 12 lessons. I guess that's 12 weeks. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, you know how he was raised from the dead? Hold your place. Because he answers that. He, he, if we had studied all five, six chapters, we got, but go to the eighth chapter, go to the eighth chapter with me and look at verse 11. This is how he was raised from the dead and this is how you are baptized into Christ. Verse 11, 8th chapter, Romans, still in Romans, Paul, 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus, right? Remember, when, you talk, when he puts Christ first, he's talking about something that was prophetic in the Old Testament that's fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. Christ Jesus. It was prophecy connected to the Messiah. Boy, Matthew 5.17, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law nor the prophets to fulfill them. And I walked you through 12 lessons of all the Messianic prophecies he had to fulfill down to not one bone on his body could be broken or he would be disqualified. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Indwelling. Do you see that? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Indwelling in 8.11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, first class condition, and He does. Back to our, our text. So that as Christ was raised, verse 4, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. You know how you're going to walk in newness of life? Through the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit who lives inside your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know? See, he said the same thing. What? Don't you know? That your body has become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit of God, third member of the Godhead, dwells inside you. And your body is not your own. 
It's been purchased with the work of Christ on the cross. Purchased. Then, he says, then, then, understanding then, 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 then glorify God with your body. And what is he talking about? How you live, where you live, your body. Listen, your body takes you where, listen, your body should be taking you everywhere God wants you to be so that you can have ministry for God. And if you pay attention to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he'll tell you, he will command from the command center within inside you where God wants you to be, where, where he wants you to be. You should pay attention to that when you stop and get gas and go to the grocery store and buy your lunch and whatever else you do. Well, when, I, when we, listen, verse 6, knowing this, <laughs> do you love that? Knowing this, see, it's one thing, listen, I, he didn't say hearing this. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Then you've got to understand it and believe it for it to become faith in you. When it becomes faith in you, it's ready to be exercised in your life in the plan of God for other people as well as yourself. It's a faith cycle. Faith comes by hearing. Believing brings us to application. Application brings you to Romans 4.21. Boy, you've got to pay attention to this stuff. I mean, God, listen, God wants everyone in this church to have a dynamic ministry because he put the Holy Spirit of God in you. You're a priest and he wants you to have a priesthood ministry. You're an ambassador and he wants you to have, you have the responsibility of evangelism. He wants, to, he wants that in your life. He wants you to have a prayer life that when somebody calls you and they ask for prayer with you, you know you can hit the target every time. You just not throw it up and hope it happens. You pray in the power of the Holy Spirit according to the Word of God. You have to have that combination. Your prayer is lifted above your responsibility in life to the plan of God by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit is the intercessor. My, my, my people. When that combination begins to work in your life then you become everything that Christ died for you to be. Can't do it in the flesh. Well, up at the top of your paper, I, I gave you an outline of the first six verses, knowing this, that the old self was crucified. I took you down through the first five verses, and I laid it out for you, because our lesson is, how, you are, how are you baptized into Christ? And he gives us a warning when he says, whenever Paul says, do you not know Here's what that means. And he says it a lot in Corinthians as well as in Romans. You're going to watch this in Paul's writing. And what you don't realize, he's really getting after you. <laughs> we all could be as coy as he is, I suppose. When he says, why don't you know? Here's what it means. You have been taught this. I've taught it to you, Timothy's taught it to you, Titus has taught it to you, Epaphroditus is talking to you, all the boys, we're all on the same page and we have taught this to you. You're not a stranger to that doctrine. That's why Paul says, you, what? Do you not know? Say that, not know? You are not ignorant about this. You have been taught. Why is it that you don't believe that? Why is it you haven't cycled that from hearing to believing? Because you have doubts. You have disbeliefs. Why is that going on in your life? That's what he means by that phrase. Just in case. All right? Now, watch this. In this verse... Verse 3, 
and he get, takes it to four, then he takes it to five. Here's what he says. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, watch this now, into Christ Jesus. This word in or with teaches positional truth. You're in something. Like you're in a, in a, a church building. You're in a church building. If it's in plus the locative in the Greek language, it means that you're inside. Give a report. Well, I'm inside the building now. It's uh, painted white. I'm sitting on some green cushions. And the guy is not a fruitcake. He's telling me things I've never heard. How come? I've been in church all my life. I've never heard these things. Because you haven't connected them. I ain't told you anything standing in the Bible. I've not gone to one research book out here and quoted them. You re- Listen, if it's, if it's in, which is ice plus the accusative, if it's in plus the locative, I then slide the building. Give me a report. Well, here's what it is. The importance is that I'm inside it. If it's ice plus the accusative, it's the emphasis is that I was someplace in the community. I, I've left my house on the way to the church. I'm going down 411. Oh, I missed it. They said to look for a flag flying, but it's a little dinky flag. Now I'm down at, what's that store down the street? I haven't got all those stores yet. Down, I just went to Dollar to turn around. Yes, go back and find that dinky flag. That's ice plus accusative. Now you pull in the parking lot. Now you walk inside the church. It's price, now it's ice plus the accusative. I'm where I'm supposed to be. I've reached my designation. What time's the church time? Church at 9.30. See, they both tell you that they, one is the direction and the intent and all that of getting to the church. The other is I'm inside and the guy's teaching. And he's giving me all kinds of material and I'm taking notes and I don't know, I'm over my head. That's all right, you're in the right place. 164 times in the New Testament the word in is used either by in plus the locative or ice plus the accusative in the Greek language. That's a whole lot of times. And you should pay attention when he tells you that you are in Christ. That's a position. In plus the locative or it's ice plus the accusative. It says that somehow you found that little church and you finally found it and you finally found that dinky flag and you are now at the place and you are inside. 164 times. That's a whole lot. And every time it's teaching you positional truth. A theology that the old church understood because men studied the word of God and taught it from the pulpit that's been lost in theology because they don't teach it anymore. And it's one of the biggest doctrines you could ever learn in your life. Positional truth. In theology, when they're talking about it in theological terms, they call it positional sanctification. Point number one. My introduction just keep getting longer and longer. It's about time to close. I've got to close the first session here. And I, well, I did have the Eucharist. Is it okay that I take my time? Is it okay? Okay. Because I feel that I, I, you know, I like to get going and rev it up and go. But, you know, the Lord has taught me how to slow myself down out here. If people want to learn, they just got to have background. And so I, I don't want to go too fast with you. I want you to get it. 
and I don't get any I don't get any credit from the Lord because I taught a whole quick hour. <laughs> but I get credit if you're learning. You understand? I want to hear well done thy good and faithful servant one day. And I don't get any credit just because I blew through an hour. Well, I taught a whole hour of some I, I want to, I want you to get it. All right? You know, you can watch film. As a football player, you can watch film every day. Don't make you a good football player. Just makes you a good film watcher. And if you can't take it to the field for 90 minutes, boy, didn't Alabama take it to the field for 90 minutes? Whew. They didn't expect that either. Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> if that faith don't work that way in football, I can tell you that. Well, listen. Let, let's take a break. Because right, I got off on football, and that's not good. So that's break time. Let's take a break. Uh, we'll come back in the second service. I'll get in. I think I've got... Well, I don't know. <laughs> I got five points, but I'm not in a hurry, okay? We're not in a hurry, unless the Lord comes back, and then it won't matter, will it? The Lord could come back before I get back with you. It won't matter then. It'll all be okay. So let's have a word of prayer. The men are going to take the offering, and uh, then we're going to have fellowship downstairs. We got some caffeine and sugar to get you through the second, the second service, and I'll come back, and I'll deal mechanic with the mechanics of... of um, what does it mean, baptized into Christ Jesus? What does that mean? And, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll cover that when we get back. I want to look at a few ideas. Uh, point number one. I can't begin to, listen, positional truth is an enormous doctrine. I can't tell you how important this is to your life and other people. The, the, uh, positional truth, next to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. I believe the second most important doctrine that you can learn is positional truth. Because so many doctrines are connected to it. Eternal life and and. All, all, so many different doctrines are connected to positional truth. Uh, you, you might hear somebody call, refer to what we call positional truth because we're teaching it. We call it positional truth. It's called positional sanctification. But I, I've got, apparently it'll take me a couple weeks just to introduce this idea to you. But point number one, remember that Paul's first two questions in Romans, the sixth chapter, verses one and two, he said, what shall we say then? There's no way you would understand that unless you know that that's, that, that's attached to chapter five and verse 21, 2021. And so he, what he does in the first five verses of Romans six is really interesting. Now listen to me. He asks four questions that you should be able to answer within your own doctrinal system. And if you can't, you're in the right church at the right time because we're going to give you all the answers. He asks four questions in the first three verses and he gives two conclusions in the last two. Now watch this. I'm going to read them again. So pay attention. Romans 6, 1 through 3, four questions, four and five, two conclusions. What shall we say then? That goes back to verse 21. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? He connected both those two questions to, to verse 21. Chapter 5, the last verse, 21. May it never be, that's a strong, get that out. No, none of that stuff. And then the question, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now I'm he's not going to answer that question right away. In fact, he's not going to answer that question until we get to chapter 8. 
And that's how do you live it? Now, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, now watch, the word therefore connects you back to the four questions now to give you answers. Therefore, here's what he says. We have been buried with him through baptism into death. That's one. We're going to call that retroactive positional truth. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, listen to me now, we're going to call that current positional truth. you got to listen to me now. Then he's going to say, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's experiential positional truth. These three truths are taught in one verse. Retroactive positional truth, current positional truth, and experiential positional truth. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Is that there? And these are all connected with Jesus dying on the cross, being buried, and being raised from the dead. And there are three positional truths for the Christian life in that. Okay? Now, in Romans, the fifth chapter, remember, remember now, in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 1, it is connected to chapter 5, verse 21. Agreed? Yes. Now, listen to me. 21 is connected to 12 of chapter 5. 12 through 21 is one section of Paul's teaching. Listen to what Paul wrote in the 5th chapter that has everything to do with our study. Now, remember, Paul has already taught this when he gets to chapter 6. Therefore, which takes us back to 5, 1 through 11, therefore, just as through one man's sin, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, that's Adam and Adam's sin, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, men because all sinned. Now he's going to go on to this whole discussion about the difference between Adam and Christ. 12 through 21, he's going to contrast what it means to be in Adam and what it means to be in Christ. The whole chapter, verses 12 through 21, you should read it. And listen, here's what you should do. Put on your paper two columns. Not now. This is your homework stuff. Put two columns and then go through and he says, here's what happens in Adam and here's what happens in Christ. And you ought to, you ought to list them and see, see the contrast. Now here's what he said in verse 12. Every human being born is born in Adam. Listen to how he said it. Fifth chapter, verse 12. Just as through one man, Adam, you know that from verse 14, Adam, he tells you in the, first chapter, in the 14th verse, he says Adam, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. What sin is that? Here it is, Genesis 2.17. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the day, the day you eat. Dying in the Hebrew, dying you will die. And there are two deaths. I went into great detail that Jesus died two deaths on the cross. Agreed? A spiritual death. Then he bowed his head. He said his, when, he, when he was through with spiritual death, he was still alive and he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That's physical death. Then he goes to Sheol and then he's raised from the dead. On the third day, he's raised from the dead. All right? we, we've covered all that. Just as through one man, Adam, sin 
Adam's sin, entered into the world of mankind, and death through sin upon mankind. What death? What, what, what spiritual death? What sin? Adam's sin. Agreed? Death through sin. And so death, spiritual death, spread to all mankind because all, are, all have sin in the, in the civil, like Adam. Everybody is dead in Adam. The Adam's sin is passed on. Adam's sin passed on his spiritual death. That's, listen, write this down. We're not going to get anywhere today anyhow. <laughs> well, we're going to get someplace. I just threw all this stuff away. It, it's important that I teach you. It's not how much I cover. It's how much you get. All right? Now, look. In Adam, we all die. The only way out of Adam, the, you, as long as you're an Adam, you ain't, you ain't got a dog chance. Whatever that is. <laughs> you ain't got a dog chance. Because you're spiritually dead. There, listen, Adam's sin brought 13 judicial charges upon mankind. Alienated from God. Spiritually blind. Under the curse of the law. Condemned by Adam's sin. Under the enmity. Separated from God in time. Listen to me. Write this down. Death. Spiritual death. Death. De death in itself means separation. You want a definition of death? Separation. That's it. Now, it depends on what you're going to talk about separation from what. Death is separation. Listen, when you have it in your family, you know it's separation. Right, Terry? I know it. I mean, I don't care what, what dies in your life. Could be a pet dog, it could be a brother, it could be a wife, it could be an uncle, a grandfather, mother. You know what it is? It's separation. How do you define it any other way? I mean, that's how you define it, that's how you live it, that's the struggle you have with it. The separation. Adam's sin separated mankind from God. It did Adam. Listen, when Adam and Eve ate of that true as separated from God, which was spiritual death, because he lived 950 years after he ate. So what dying will you die? What was that? It was spiritual death is separation from God in time. And if you don't accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, dear hearts, which means that he died on the cross to remove that sin barrier. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. You will, if you die in that state, you will be separated from God in eternity. And that's called the second spiritual death. Read the last two chapters of Revelation. He'll tell you that. Death is separation. When Adam ate that apple, or whatever he ate, he was separated from God in time, spiritually. And God provided a way for him to get back, and that was through animal sacrifice. It was still going on in the fourth chapter, and we know that. He said, Ron, how do you know that? I know it by the fourth chapter. This occurred in the third chapter of Genesis, and this is how you recover, is in the fourth chapter. And that represented Christ. The animal's blood represented the blood of Christ one day. It was called the prophetic gospel. As a human being, the, the, every human being is born with Adam's sin. 
I, I, listen, I'd wrote it different, but I didn't write it at all. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin. So, death spread to all mankind because of the sinned. Because all, are, all, all sinned. All have sinned. Now, let me see if I can get this thing. Here I go. Oh. Uh, did I hit that thing too too, too much? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's all I hear about. <laughs> On your paper. <laughs> it's a good thing I can teach. On your paper somewhere. <clears throat> Listen to me. Draw two circles. Somewhere on your paper, draw two circles. You got a left circle and a right circle, <laughs> okay? Now give a little space between them. Give me a little space. Are you with me? Yeah. All right, now listen. In the left circle, looking at your paper, in the left circle, put a dot and say, in Adam. Have you done that? Why aren't you doing that? If you already know this, it's okay. If you don't know it, you should be doing it. In the right circle... Put a dot and put in Christ. Let's come back to the left circle. In between, in between those two circles, I want you to write 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Here's what it says. In Adam... All die. So on that left circle where, you, where it says in Adam, put all over, somewhere in that circle, right, over it or whatever you want, all die. If you're an Adam, all die. That's spiritual death. Did you write it on the top of your paper, 1 Corinthians 15, 22? All right. All right. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, same passage, in Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. All are made alive. Write that down now. All are made alive. Does it say some or say all? all. Did you write all? <clears throat> now here's the question. This is, this, this is the, the problem we have. You're either in Adam spiritually dead, or you're in Christ, spiritually alive. Agreed? 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, up, up there by 1 Corinthians 15, 22, put a comma and write 45. Because he says there's a first Adam and there's a last Adam. And there they are. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says there's a first Adam and there's a last Adam. The last Adam's name is Jesus Christ. Got all that on your paper? Oh, boy, this is good. You got a neighbor that needs Christ? This is what you do to him. I'm walking you through how you talk to somebody about Christ. Now, the question is, if all are born in Adam, and, all, and they're dead, all are spiritually dead, separated from God in time, how do I get over to Jesus Christ where all, all are made spiritual life for time and eternity? It's that question, isn't it? So in between those two circles, draw you a cross, draw a cross, look up here, then draw a line down like this for, that, for his burial, and then go straight up for a little ways. 
That's his resurrection. That's the gospel. Right down underneath that, did you draw that? Cross here, draw a line down here, that's his burial, up for resurrection. You got that? That's a symbol for the gospel. Now, underneath that, write 1 Corinthians, or a 1C, however you do it, 15, 1 through 4, because it tells you exactly what the gospel is. It is that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, was buried and raised according to the scriptures. You don't have salvation in Christ any other way. He's got to die, be buried, and raised to be the Messianic Savior of the world. I mean, Horton said it well in his prayer. Dead men don't, <laughs> don't have life to give you. The only guy that did that, and listen, without his resurrection, he doesn't have it to give. He was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit that lives in your mortal body and brings, listen, and changes, changes the whole nomenclature of the human body because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Your body is no longer a, a fleshly dwelling for sin, but for the righteousness of God. Think about that. Now, over here, we're all born in Adam. How do we get over here into Christ? You have to believe that Jesus died on that cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. Now, underneath where you wrote, for where, wherever you, underneath the cross and the burial and that, write down Colossians 1.13. And I'm going to talk with you about this and then we're going to go home today. We're going to come back to this next week because now we've got a better understanding of where we're going to go with it. And boy, if I got great news for you, what I'm about to teach you over the next couple of weeks is just going to, is going to transform your life. Positional truth is the most wonderful doctrine you could ever possibly know. Now, I'm in Colossians 1.13, are you? I want you to put your eyes on this. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one in the pew. I want you to put your eyes on it. Let me tell you what I've learned over my Christian life. There are three things you do with the Word of God that sticks in your soul. Apart from, make sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life. You put your eye on the Word, you put your mind on the Word, and you put your hand on the Word. And, and I'm doing that right now with you. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that. And let me tell you, when you do those three exercises with the Word of God, it'll, it'll imprint it on your soul. I won't, have to I won't have to teach this over and over and over again, will I, Willie? Because you get it. I'm going to teach it over and over, but you get it. 113. Now watch this. For He rescues us from the domain of darkness. That's in Adam. 13 judicial charges. One of them is darkness, death, enmity, unrighteous, ungodly, sinner, under the raft of God, all of that. You pick up one of those pamphlets, 50 things, on the way out. Now watch this. He rescues us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Now watch this. You got a cross in between it? Yeah, have you got the cross and the burial and the resurrection between the two circles? Agreed? Yes. Everybody got it? Put your pencil or your pen on the cross and, and do a loop over to the left circle. And put the word R for rescued on that line somewhere. Rescued. Does it tell you that? It says, He rescues us from the domain of darkness. 
Now, are you with me? Go back to the cross and loop a line over to the other circle in Christ and put the letter T for transferred. Because that's exactly what Colossians 1.13 taught you. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's grace, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves as a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Here's what he does. He rescues you from being a POW in Adam's sin. Flies you out by the grace of God into the safety. He transfers you. He transports you. He rescues from POW and then transports you into Christ. He does that all himself. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. The mechanics is that when you believe it, you receive it. And what happens, you get rescued out of Adam. Once I've been rescued, rescued out of Adam by the grace of God and transported or transferred over to Christ, I'm no longer separated from God, so I can put a mark through that. The left circle in Adam, I can put a mark through it. Agreed? I'm done with that deal. How do I know it? Because he can only die one death for all sin, for all time, and that's been done. And when I believe it, that's done. You understand that? Listen to Colossians 1.14. The kingdom of his beloved son, 13, in whom, the beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know what sins is? That picks up the Christian life. I am rescued from Adam's sin, transported or refer, transferred over to Christ. This is never to happen again in my life. That deal is done. Those 13 judicial charges are removed from my life once and forever. My name is in the book of life. That's all that counts now. When that was done, my name got in the book. That is done. My name will never be blotted out. That's because I'm saved by grace through faith and not of myself. It's not by works. Works brings debt work, the best works can do for you is bring wages. You don't get those if you don't work. Well, <laughs> that's old school, isn't it? <laughs> that's a long day gone. That's a, that's a day gone by. So, on your paper you have 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Agreed? You have Ephesians 2, 8, 9 on your paper, right? For by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourself as a gift of God. Now write this one down, Romans 1, 16. But you don't get saved by works, you get saved by grace. Works is about wages. 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, we know what the gospel is now. Christ died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead, give me life everlasting. I get eternal life because he has life to give it to me. Christ come out of the grave, he has eternal life to give me. And I get that as a gift. I don't have to earn eternal life. There are 50 things that I get from God in my salvation I can never lose in time and eternity. One of them is eternal life. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and then to the Greek or Gentile. How about that? 
about that, Gentiles? <laughs> yeah, how about that? I love that verse, don't you? Thank you, God, to include me in the wonderful work of your son. Now, when we come back next week, I'm going to talk about positional truth. What does it mean to be in Christ? Right? Because once I'm in Christ, I am no longer separated. Listen, John 14, 6. No man comes to the Father except what? Through the Son. Well, very good. Very good. We're going to come back and we're, we're going to talk about the three, different, the three different doctrines that are important to your life on positional truth. Current, retroactive positional truth, current tr truth, and experiential truth. They're dynamite. You do not want to miss this. They're dynamite. Well, let's have a word of prayer and let's go home.